Hi everybody, my name is Jay Suko and I am based in Los Angeles, California and I have my own company called Today Improv and we teach improv to businesses, actors, regular folks all throughout the world. I'm really excited to be here offering some tips and exercises to help you become a more confident improviser. I look at improv as not like you make good or bad choices. It's just you can make it easy or difficult on yourself. And so uh, this is like a cafeteria. Take what you can and then leave the rest. But hopefully these will give you some skills and tools you can add to your tool belt. Because remember, these are all tools, not rules. Anything anybody tells you, it's a tool, not a rule. Uh, first off, I think you have to accept what's going on. And right now, um, we have to accept where we are. I'm currently recording this in Los Angeles, and we're in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so we just have to accept that that's what it is. That doesn't mean that you're not um, without power. I think accepting it is very powerful because then you can um, move forward with what your choices are, just like in an improv scene. Accept the scene you're in, uh, not the one you want to be in, and then move forward with those choices. So I've got a couple of exercises I'd like to give you today that will help you become more sharp when you're by yourself. People have asked me, you know, can you improvise alone or what skills can you use when you don't have people around you? And I think there are several things you can do uh, when yourself, when you're by yourself to maintain your, those skills. And so uh, the first one I want to talk about are monologues. Now, monologues are a great tool for any improviser. And when I first started, we did in our long form shows, we did a lot of monologues and Right now, there's a form called the Armando, which uses monologues very well, but not a lot of times do you see characters step out and deliver monologues in the scenes as much as you used to. So that's something that you can always insert into your uh, long form and short form play as well. If you know the game Oscar winning moment, that's just basically delivering a monologue when prompted. So there are two ways I want to talk to you today about coming up with character monologues. Now, the first way is through an object. You can use an object to inform your character. I'm going to pick an object from my desk here, and then I'm going to hold the object up, and I'm going to deliver a monologue to you. Now, this object is going to be something that means something to me, okay? So uh, I'm going to pick, <laughs> I guess I'm going to pick this one right here. This is the first one that I saw, and it's this. Oh, oh, look at the kitty cat. This is actually my own cat. Uh, I have two cats and this is one of my cats. This is my cat, Lucy. Uh, Lucy and her sister came home with me one day when I was very sad and depressed. And I went to the pound and I saw Lucy and I said, I want to have that cat so much. And then Lucy's sister, Ella came and Ella did not want to be left alone. Ella is a little bit more of a challenge than Lucy, uh, but Lucy right here, uh, Lucy is really my angel, and I'm so blessed to have her. They say that animals aren't part of the family, but I disagree. Lucy is as much of a part of my family as my own mother and father are, and I'm so happy to have her. Lucy brings joy to my life anywhere I go, and Oh boy, oh boy, you better believe that I bring her joy as well. I love you, Lucy. You know, Lucy acts more like a dog than a dog does. I know people say that like cats aren't dogs or they don't have tendencies as dogs, but I disagree because Lucy shows you unconditional love. And that's all we really want in this world is unconditional love. I love you. And scene. So that monologue was inspired by something I just grabbed from my desk. Personally, I'll be honest, I'm not a cat person. I think dogs are way better than cats for myself personally. But because I took this object and I grabbed it, it's more, to me, it leads to more interesting choices and moments if I'm into the thing, if I am a cat person, than if I'm not a cat person. So this also gives you an opportunity to play people that are different than yourselves and really try to be them. I really want to be somebody that enjoys a cat rather than, hey, I'm pretending I, I enjoy cats, but we all know I, I don't. That will open up the different characters you can play on stage. 
Uh, also, I drew from a lot of my own personal experience. I know somebody who has a cat uh, whose name is Lucy. So I'm making it easy on myself just to draw those little facts about the scene because it's fact and truth is what we're talking about here, right? And the fact is I'm a cat person, but the truth is how I feel, right? So as you're doing these monologues, you can start um, headed more towards the truth than talk about the fact or details of who that person is. We want you to show us, not tell us. Show, so show us how you feel rather than just telling us how you feel. I had a teacher once who said to me, improvisers should never say how they feel on stage. They should show how they feel. And so why? While I think that it's valuable to say how you feel, I think it's also um, a lot of times more valuable to show us that's how you feel rather than saying. So now you're into your emotions, which means you're out of your head. So the first um, exercise you can do is pick an object and then go ahead and deliver a monologue. What's fun is to pick an object also that you don't know um, nobody's going to be watching you, so you can take these risks and try to come up with the character right there on the spot and uncover who they are uh, in that moment. And don't worry about being right or wrong. And again, this is something you can do on your own, so please give yourself the permission and the grace to fail as you do these. If you notice that you start stuttering or you say something you don't mean to say, incorporate that into your character rather than ignoring it or trying to brush it aside. I want you to incorporate it. It's like jazz. I want you to play the wrong note again and again, and then it becomes part of the pattern. Remember, as improvisers, we're making this up. So you can't apologize because you don't know what you're doing and people don't know that it's made up. They don't know that it's a mistake, I should say. Like they know it's created on the spot, but a lot of times they think we've scripted it. That's how good it is. Even bad improv, it's funny. Even bad improv, they think we've scripted. So they thought we spent time preparing it. So as you continue, start incorporating those mistakes into your character and make them um, traits or even character flaws as you go. So one is object, um, uh, monologue. So take a monologue based on an object and have it have value to you, right? It means something to you. It's okay to be like, uh, this cat thing, my ex-wife gave it to me. I hate her. Like, that's fine. But I think that's also a lot of times a lazy choice. We make a choice to hate things. So make a choice to enjoy it. Make a choice to be interested. If you're interested, you're going to be interesting to a lot of people. Uh, the second monologue you can do is developing a catchphrase or a gesture. So those are things you can repeat in the monologue is a catchphrase or a gesture and see where it leads you. A lot of the fun in improv is not knowing where you're gonna go, but enjoying where you're being led by this. So it's like, let it come to you rather than forcing it, which is, you know, discovery versus invention, right? So let it come to you. For those of you who are musicians also or athletes, that's a very big part of it is you're getting in the zone. When, when a basketball was easy to me, it just, everything slowed down and I felt like I was in the zone and I couldn't miss. And that's what we try to get to with improv. So the second um, exercise we're gonna do uh, the second one is using a catchphrase and a gesture. So uh, I might just do one. I might do both. I'm not sure. But I think the um, gesture that I'm going to um, use, I'm going to do both. The gesture will be something like this that I'll keep doing. And then the catchphrase is going to be, um, uh, oh, it's going to be, that's life. That's life. You know? Sometimes you just gotta take the good with the bad. Sometimes you get the bread and sometimes you get the butt end of the loaf, but oh man, that's life. It's like you can't plan for it. It just is what it is. You just have to be along there for the ride. You know, sometimes you're the batter and sometimes you're the pitcher. And sometimes you, you strike out and sometimes you hit a home run. Sometimes you strike them out and sometimes they hit a home run. But that's life. It's something that you have to enjoy as you go. You know, take it from me. Um, I've been pretty much the same as I have my whole life. And as I'm nearing the end of it, I'm thinking to myself, I haven't really done enough. And I really need to do more. And why haven't I done more? Why haven't I been more? I should. I should. I need to. I want to. I'll be honest with you, there's nothing I can do about it now. I am who I am. 
I do what I do. That's life. And scene. So I used the gesture this, and I used the that's life, and I took a moment, and my thought process was, oh, I'm somebody who just, you know, accepts how it is. I don't blame people. And then I also discovered, oh, I'm probably, I, I placed myself a little bit older, and I said, maybe I've just had these regrets I've recently thought about, and then I just have to accept it and say, that's life. Part of that probably, to be honest with you, is influenced in what's happening in the world outside. So go easy on yourself. You're going to be facing a lot of those moments because of it's so overwhelming, but it, everything passes. So if you can warm yourself up and do something silly and move and all of that, that might help you get past what's going on in life to get back to a sense of play. Um, but if you do this and all your scenes revolve around what's going on in your current day, that's okay too. Just go easy on yourself, but realize the things that happen to us in life do affect us out there on stage. Uh, another thing that I want to do is um, an exercise that comes from this book, which is Theater Games for the Lone Actor by Viola Spolin. This is a book that I got off of Amazon. You can still order it now. And it gives you a ton of exercises to stay sharp right here uh, when you're by yourself. Things you can do on your own. And one is an, uh, something called um, What's Beyond, um, and it's Entering. And the instructions are... Uh, reflect what happened in the place you have just come from. Let your body reflect what just took place. Show it in your shoulders, your walk, your fingertips. Show, don't tell, which is another big thing for improvisers. Show, don't tell. So I'm going to do that really quick. I'm just going to take a moment. And this is again called What's Beyond Entering. <laughs> I got to tell you. They are having a ball in the ballroom next to us. I mean, I thought it was I was going into the bathroom, but when I ended up, it was a ballroom. And they are in the middle of doing the Macarena. Hey, Doug, you remember the Macarena? It's like... Hey, Macarena! And they are just going crazy out there. Nobody even asked me what I was doing. They said to me, hey, come on in. And all of a sudden, I'm doing the Macarena. I'm doing a conga line. I got to tell you, they are having a ball in there. And it, it makes me feel real good. It makes me feel real good. It makes me feel real good that I know that there are people out there who just let me join the party. I think that's all I'm looking for, Doug. All I'm looking for is I just want to join the party. <laughs> And I'm glad to be here with you. And this is great. Don't get me wrong. Your wedding is fantastic. This is one of the best weddings I've ever been to. Uh, but next door, man, oof, they are having a ball next door. So, uh, yeah, anyway, um, uh, apologies. Uh, uh, everybody, uh, raise a glass to Doug. <laughs> Cheers. And scene. Um, boy, that was a lot of fun. I decided also personally to change up my energy because I had been a little lower energy. I decided I want to do something of more of a higher energy character. And my monologue, actually, I started delivering it to one person. And as I was talking, I discovered, oh, what would be fun is that I actually am walking in. I'm coming back to my best friend's wedding and I'm giving a toast. <laughs> and before I did the toast, I did all of that information. And then towards the end of the monologue, I thought, oh, maybe I'm talking to my best my best friend is getting married and I'm on the dais and I need to turn to the rest of the group and I need to raise a glass and give a toast. So that just was a bunch of really fun discoveries. It's always easier for me to stand up when I'm doing anything online as well. Uh, but I was like, I'm just going to change my energy. So to be able to just change my energy without having any idea what it was going to go to was super fun. Uh, I also like the name Doug. I think Doug's a fun, fun name to say. Um, if you're doing online teaching, are you doing online training? Uh, stand up. A lot of times we sit down. And what happens is when you sit down, you become a passive viewer. And think of your body position, your physicality. You sit down, you look into a screen, you're probably watching something. You're not as active. So just the action of standing and giving some movement really helps. Uh, as you continue to improvise, think about using the technology instead of fighting against it. Like there are things we can't do 
that we could have done before when we were on stage with someone else. But now there's an opportunity to improvise with people all over the world. So take advantage of that. Look at how you use the camera. If you go in like this, if you go back, you can actually now walk into frame and then walk out of frame. So changing that a little bit will help. I think everything is like flipping on, on its ear. Some of the things we're used to in improv, some things translate well, some things don't. So uh, it's trial and error right now. Uh, some things that might not have worked in the past might work now. Um, so there are a couple really good exercises in this book. And for those of you who don't know, Viola Spohn is kind of the, <laughs> called the high priestess of improv, but her work um, derives from her teacher, um, Neva Boyd, and Neva Boyd's focus was, she was a sociologist who focused on the importance of play in adults. And then Viola Spolin uh, took that a step further. And among other things, she helped immigrant children in Chicago in the early uh, 1900s, uh, hundreds assimilate into America uh, using improv games. And she would look at problems such as none of these children speak the same language. And then she said, well, Let's create a game to help them learn and help them grow. And that's where gibberish came from. And that's why there's a lot of gibberish and emotional games in improv. So she has several books, but this one specifically right now for what you can do individually to keep sharp, keep your sh skills uh, sharp. Um, two more things that will help. One is new experiences. So once, you know, this week, what I want you to do is Listen to a podcast you would never listen to. Listen to a new music you would never listen to. Um, put on clothing at home you wouldn't normally wear. Um, you know, just try something new. Have something new to eat. Like, just open yourself up to new experiences. Watch something new on TV. Watch, watch a movie you would never watch. Uh, watch, you know, open yourself up because then the more new experiences you have, the more you can add that to what you do. Um, and then the second one is... Uh, follow the fear. Every Friday is hashtag follow the fear Friday. Uh, and it's where we're encouraged to do something that scares us. So something once a week that scares you. Now, of course, I'm talking safety first. So, you know, don't do something uh, silly and get yourself hurt, but do something that scares you. And that might mean returning a phone call or an email, getting to that, those taxes, whatever it is, do something once a week that scares you. We have right now a really good excuse uh, to do something that scares us because of the situation we're in. So you can use that as, as an excuse to reach out to people. But even when this passes, what you can do is you can once a week do something that scares you and just say, you know, for me, it might be uh, when I go to a restaurant and I ordered food I didn't like or not didn't like. I ordered food that I, um, you know, in a different dish came. And it's like, oh, I didn't want cheese on this hamburger. Um, normally I might just eat it anyway, but a fear thing for me might just be to say, oh, excuse me, could, could I have this without cheese? Um, and it seems like for some people so simple and so easy to do. And for other people, it might seem overwhelming because um, that's just who they are. So do something once a week that scares you. Uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Um, you know, my class comes with lifetime tech support. So if you want any additional information or have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter um, at Jay Suko, or I think on Facebook, I'm at J Austin Suko. But yeah, uh, and I'm at J, J-A-Y at todayimprov.com, T-O-D-A-Y-I-M-P-R-O-V.com. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for tuning in and listening, and uh, I hope you have a great day. Follow the fear, it shall set you free.